Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last lecture, we discussed a gendered socio-technical construction in the case of the smart house. Now, in, in the discussion on the social setting of technology in contradistinction uh, to uh, the technological setting of society is important and in this lecture, we will we'll end with the section on the social shaping of technology, that if a technology is uh, workable, if a technology, uh, if a particular technology works well in a certain context, it does not imply that it work, it will work well in all other contexts. I mean that, that this one size fits all, if, if one size fits all is the hallmark of a technologically deterministic society, then, then interrogating the one size fits all okay, becomes the hallmark of the social setting of technology. Okay? That no, this one size fits all uh, is not applicable okay? in, uh, in the context of uh, uh, the development and application of a particular technology. Okay? That is, and in this context, Nelly Woods room points out the, the decline of the one size fits all paradigm or how reproductive scientists try to, to cope with such postmodern phenomenon of technology. I mean, uh, uh, I am not going to discuss more on postmodernity as such. Okay? Okay? I mean, what, what, what does postmodernity uh, refer to? Uh, basically, postmodernity refers to the rejection of all grand theories. It may be Darwinian uh, uh, evolution of species or Marx's um, uh, uh, principles of dialectic and materialist conception of history or Freudian psychology of mind. Okay? I mean, it rejects uh, the grand theories. Okay? Uh, uh, Postmodernity uh, uh, propounds for multicultural ethos. Okay? And so on. I mean, uh, this is not a course on social, sociological theory or political theory where I'll have to discuss postmodernity at length and in detail. What I'm going to do here, I'll discuss the work of Nelly Odson in the context of the decline of this one size fits all paradigm, a history of contraceptive technology. Have you have you ever heard of andrology? I repeat the question, have you ever heard of andrology? The very fact that, the very fact that, uh, that andrology, the medical specialism concerned with the reproductive functions of men is still a central profession compared to its bigger sister that is gynecology. Uh, that is one of, I mean is one of the striking examples okay, of the institutional and discursive processes of othering, othering, uh, if you look at this othering in the biomedical sciences. That is why othering process of, process of othering uh, of scientific discourse in biomedical sciences. 
Okay. Then feminist discourses uh, since the 1970s, 80s, 90s and so on have provided major challenges to these othering processes of scientific discourse. Okay. The, the, the purpose of this lecture is to show how major changes uh, in the dominant paradigm of subject object dichotomies emerged in one specific area of the biomedical sciences that is the reproductive side. Okay. One must describe how the identification of women as the other result in setting the female body apart in, in separate branch of medicine, in a separate branch of medicine. The emergence of gynecology and sex uh, endocrinology in the late 19th and early 20th centuries established a discursive practice in which sex and reproduction became considered more fundamental to women's rather than man's nature. Okay. This is this is important. Okay. Why do we think that the reproductive capacity is essentially uh, tuned towards or it essentially uh, uh, related to only women's nature not man's nature. That is why I, I started with the question have you ever heard of andrology? If gynecology deals with the reproductive abilities or, or reproductive sides of women, then andrology deals with the, the, the reproductive abilities, I mean reproductive uh, side of aspects of men, okay, in this sense. Okay. It, is, it is very important, that is why I said, uh, I mean what uh, uh, Odson suggested that the emergence of gynecology and sex endocrinology in the late 19th and early 20th centuries established a discursive practice in which sex and reproduction became considered more fundamental to women's rather than man's nature. Okay. Then, then if, if, I, if we say that no it is, from, uh, it is considered Okay, it is dubbed, uh, it has been portrayed okay, in a more patriarchal society, uh, 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 portrayed as more fundamental to women's rather than man's nature, then how we try to institutionalize women as the other, othering process of scientific discourse in biomedical sciences. Okay. What is this, the institutionalization of women? as the other. I mean there must be a shift in focus from similarities to differences. Okay. The, the institutional process of othering in medicine has a recent history. For, for our postmodern minds, I mean those who reject all grand theories, it is hard to imagine that, that for, for 2000 years male and female bodies were not conceptualized in terms of differences. Medical texts from the ancient Greeks until the late 18th century described male and female bodies as fundamentally similar. Women had even the same genitals as men with one difference, theirs are inside the body and not outside it. In this approach characterized by uh, Thomas uh, uh, Lacquo uh, as the one sex model, the female body was understood as a male turned inside herself not a different sex, but a lesser version of the male body. Okay. It, was, it was only in the 18th century that biomedical discourse began to conceptualize the female body as the other. A body, because 18th century also is very important. In 18th century, it was also a marker of the change in the mode of production. You see, in 18th century, we, we saw industrial revolution, we witnessed critical thinking, modernity, reasoning capacity. Okay. That is why it, it, was, it was only in the 18th century that we find that biomedical discourse began to conceptualize the female body as the other. 
that is a body that was to be considered an essentially different uh, as, as essentially different from the male body. Okay. The long established tradition that emphasized bodily similarities over differences began to be heavily criticized. In the 18th century, anatomists increasingly focused on bodily differences between the sexes and argued that sex was not restricted to the rep reproductive organs or as one physician put it, I mean I am quoting um, soon that uh, uh, that the essence of sex is not confined to a single organ, but extends through more or less perceptible nuances into every part. The first part of the body to become sexualized was the skeleton. If sex differences could be found in the hardest part of the body, it would be likely that sex penetrated every muscle, vein and organ attached to and molded by the skeleton. Okay. That is what uh, even, even uh, Skybinger uh, also mentioned. Okay. In, in 19th century cellular physiology, okay, in, in 19th century uh, cellular physiology, the medical gauge shifted from the bones to the cells. By the late 19th century, medical scientists had extended this sexualization to every imaginable part of the body, bones. Uh, blood vessels, cells, hair and brain. Only the eye seems to have no sex. Okay. That that is what uh, 19th century, uh, in, in 19th century cellular physiology. Okay. Biomedical discourse thus shows a clear shift in focus from similarities to differences. This shift seems to have caused by epistemological sociopolitical changes rather than by scientific progress. In, 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 in the book Making Sex, okay, Thomas Lecco uh, described this shift in the context of changes in the political climate. The French Revolution and new liberal claims in the 18th century led to new ideals about the social relationships between men and women in which the complementarity between the sexes was, was mm, emphasized. Okay. Uh, was, it was emphasized. This theory of complementarity taught that man and woman are not physical and moral equals, but complementary opposites. Women now became viewed as fundamentally different from and thus incomparable to men. Okay. Uh, the, the, the theory of sexual complementarity was meant for men and uh, I mean the, the, the theory of um, sexual complementarity uh, was meant to keep women out of competition with men, designing separate spheres for men and women. In this theory, which came to be known as the doctrine of the two spheres, the sexes were expected to complement rather than compete with each other. The female and the male body became conceptualized in terms of opposite bodies with incommensurably different organs, functions and feelings. That is what Lacker, uh, Thomas Lacker suggested. This, this change is visible in medical language as well, uh, which Lacker uh, uh, in making sex in 1990, he mentioned that, um, and that this, this change is visible in medical language. Uh, I mean organs that had shared a name, ovaries and uh, uh, testicles uh, were now linguistically distinguished, organs that had not been distinguished by a name of their own. The vagina, for example, were given one. Okay. Following this, following this shift, the female body became the medical object par excellence. Foucault in 1981 suggested this. Michel Foucault, that, that the female body became the medical object par excellence, emphasizing women's unique sexual character. Medical scientists now started to identify the ultimate cause of women's otherness, the medical the 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 medical literature okay the medical literature of this period shows a radical naturalization of femininity okay in which scientists reduced women to one specific organ in the 18th and 19th centuries scientists set out to localize the essence of femininity uh, uh, in in different places in the body 
until the middle of the 19th century, scientists considered the uterus as the seat of femininity. This, this conceptualization is reflected in the statement of the German poet and naturalist uh, Goethe. Okay? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, just I'm just trying to uh, uh, look at different different uh, look at uh, such dimension here uh, in the works of in the in the works of Nelly Otsur. Okay, in the middle of the 19th century, medical attention began to shift from the uterus to the the ovaries, which came to be regarded as largely autonomous control centers of reproduction in the female animal, while in humans there were uh, they were thought to be the essence of humanity itself. In the in the late 19th century, in the late 19th century, the search for the cause of women's otherness eventually led to setting women's bodies uh, apart uh, in a medical special regime that is called gynecology. In her Moskoshi uh, once pointed out that. Um, I mean, is he pointed out how the belief that the female body is finalized for reproduction defined the study of natural women as a separate branch of medicine. Okay. With the emergence of gynecology, women became identified as a social group of, as, a, as a special group of patients. Okay. The turn of the century, I mean the turn of the 20th century witnessed the founding of societies, journals. Uh, and hospitals specifically devoted to the diagnosis and treatment of the female body. Women thus became set apart uh, in the discursive and institutional practices of the biomedical sciences. The growth of gynecology was not paralleled by the establishment of a complementary uh, uh, science of masculinity okay? uh, uh, as the male was the standard of the species he could not be set apart on the basis of his sex. Okay. This, this institutional process of othering was continued and reinforced by the rise of sex uh, endocrinology, a discipline devoted to the study of sex hormones that emerged in the 1920s and 1930s. Otsun, uh, in, in the book Beyond the Natural Body, described how the very existence of gynecology facilitated a situation in which the new science of sex endocrinology focused almost exclusively on the female body. The by then, the, the, the by then established gynecological practices had transformed the female body into an easily accessible supplier of research materials. Okay? a convenient uh, gyna pig for tests and an organized audience for the products of sex endocrinology. Both laboratory scientists and pharmaceutical firms depended on these institutional practices to provide them with the necessary tools and materials to transform the hormonal model of the body into a new set of disease categories, diagnostic tools and drugs. Sex uh, endocrinologists integrated the notion of the female body as a reproductive body into the hormonal model, but not without thoroughly changing it. They provided the medical profession with tools to intervene in features that had been considered inaccessible prior to the hormonal era. The, the introduction of diagnostic tests and drugs enabled the medical profession to intervene in the menstrual cycle and the menopause, thus bringing the natural features of reproduction and aging into the domain of medical intervention. Okay. The, the, the introduction of the concept of sex hormones not only changed the medical treatment of the female body, but also redefined the existing social uh, uh, configurations structuring medical practice. Okay. In this, I mean, uh, I mean the, 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 the field of sex endocrinology generated a set of social relationships that did not exist prior to its emergence. What, what changed in this episode uh, according to Utsborn uh, was the question of who was entitled to claim authoritative knowledge about the female body. 
the hormonal model enabled gynecologists to draw the female body more and more deeply into the gynecological clinic. Gynecologists, however, had to share their increased medical authority with another professional group that is the laboratory scientists. With the introduction of the concept of sex hormones, scientists explicitly linked women's disease, diseases with laboratory practice. The, the, the study of women as the other thus became extended from the clinic to the laboratory and thereby firmly rooted in the heart of the life sciences. Okay? Now, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, development of the first physiological means of contraception focused exclusively on women. Okay? Before, before coming to one size fits all, let us discuss one, one interesting argument, uh, I mean uh, which uh, Woodsborne uh, has mentioned that, that Margaret Sanger, a woman, a women's rights activist and pioneer for birth control in the United States of America, believed that the most important threat to women's independence came from unwanted and unanticipated pregnancies. Sang, Sanger, Margaret Sanger was very explicit about the type of contraceptive uh, 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 which had to be, uh, I mean, uh, about, uh, I mean, he was, she was, she was very much uh, explicit about what type of contraceptive technologies uh, uh, or what type of contraceptive had to be developed. It had to be a universal contraceptive that could be used by all women regardless of color, class, age or educational background. These early ideas on contraception set the stage for uh, uh, reproductive paradigm that is one size fits all. Why we should do with this kind of thing okay? that one size fits all. The adage that uh, one size fits all of the 1960s and 1970s became the cornerstone of R and D in contraceptives. Okay. Bearing in mind this short history of the process of othering in the biomedical sciences, it will be no surprise that the development of the first physiological means of contraception focused exclusively on women. The history of the contraceptive pill indicates how the process of othering required an emphasis on similarities among women. Uh, that is how we, uh, uh, I mean remarkably this time the choice to focus on women rather than men was not made by the medical profession or laboratory scientists, but, but um, as, uh, as we discussed that how an, an uh, outsider rather, uh, outsider I mean uh, not in a literal sense, but in a, in a more figurative sense, in a more metaphorical sense. Okay? The, he, uh, Margaret uh, uh, Sanger was not uh, a laboratory scientist or, or he does not belong to a pharmaceutical firm, uh, but, but the way Sanger was very much explicit about the type of contraceptive uh, which had to be uh, uh, or, or, or what kind of contraceptive, what type of contraceptive had to be developed it, uh, for, for Sanger it had to be it must be uh, a universal contraceptive that could be used by all women regardless of color, class, age or uh, educational background. Okay? This, this one size fits all okay? and this is important uh, and we are trying to do this, we are trying to discuss this. Okay? Uh, these, these early ideas on contraception set the stage for the for the reproductive paradigm of the 1960s and 19, early 1970s, uh, the quest for universal contraceptives can be considered the ultimate consequence of the process of othering. Classifying women as the other directs the attention to similarities among women. Consequently, the design of medical technology does not have to take into account the diversity of its users. Okay? This is important. Then the history of the pill, contraceptive pill, the, the, the history of the pill 
therefore, uh, reads as an uh, intriguing story of how scientists try to construct similarities between women. This is very obvious in the text that uh, Pincus and his colleagues published reporting the clinical trials of the pill. A perusal of these publications according to um, uh, according to uh, Woodsor, uh, that uh, uh, it, it they reveal a very telling picture. The women participating in the clinical trials have disappeared from the from the stage. They were replaced quite simply by the number of treated menstrual cycles. In the 1958 publication of one of the first large scale clinical trials, Pincus concluded that that in the in the 1279 cycles during which the regimen of treatment was meticulously followed, there was not a single pregnancy. In the, in the 1959 publication in Science, which described all four failed trials uh, of the pill, it was reported, I mean Pincus, I am quoting Pincus here, uh, we have recently collected and analyzed the data to November 1958 from these four projects and present here the, 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 the outstanding findings derived from this data, 18, 830 subjects took the medication for a total of 8133 menstrual cycles or 635 women years. Okay. This is I mean the, the this, this I mean uh, a popular writer also I mean um, I mean Meisel also wrote uh, um, about this I mean in the in the hormone quest. Okay. In the context of the West Indies I mean Caribbean uh, island. Uh, and such such representative strategy okay, clearly emphasizes the similarities between women. The use of such categories as cycle replaces the individual subject by the group, suggesting a continuity that did not exist in the trials. That suggestion simultaneously affirms continuity while obscuring discontinuity by framing new scientific categories for data measurement. A representation in terms of cycles implies an abstraction from the bodies of individual women to the universal category of a physical process. Here we see how scientific texts are not simply a reflection of the proceedings of research. Texts are a far stronger uh, tool than that. They are a representation which creates a new reality. Okay? The discourse of the discourse of pill researchers constructed women's bodies as universal with respect to their reproduct uh, reproductive functions. Okay. The, 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 the construction of similarities between women is not just a matter of discourse. During the testing of the pill, similarities were literally created by the introduction of a specific regimen of medication. In one of the first clinical trials, which Meisel uh, carried out in the context of um, the Caribbean island, the West Indies, okay, she pointed out that women were quite distressed when they, they noticed that their first that, that, that their menstruations ceased during the treatment with oral uh, uh, pro, uh, um, uh, progestins. If these if these women were distressed, Pincus reflected it would be very unlikely that women taking uh, uh, progestins uh, for uh, contraceptive purposes would experience similar uh, reactions to cessation. The a contraceptive that, that suppresses menstruation did not meet the requirements of a universal contraceptive. Pincus therefore, the, uh, uh, therefore changed the medication, the pills should be taken for 20 days starting on the fifth day after menstruation as was the practice in the hormonal treatment of menstrual irregularities in the 1940s. This suggestion set the standard for the administration of uh, progestins in all later trials and eventually for the use of the contraceptive pill in the 1990s. The, the choice, the choice of this regimen of medication was set by moral objections to any drugs that would interfere with menstruation. Pincus was directly confronted with this norm by uh, Shell of the pharmaceutical uh, firm, which put the pill on the market. 
Okay. I mean the, the testing of hormones as contraceptives did not take place in the continental US where the laboratory research took place, but in the uh, Caribbean island. This is also important. This, this research laboratory was located in the United States of America, but the research was conducted in the Caribbean. It was women of color from uh, former colonial settings who entered this history as gyna pigs of one of the most revolutionary drugs in the history of medicine. The choice to test hormones on women of color only be made because scientists did not recognize any fundamental differences between women. What, what Pincus tried to mention here that actually in view of the ability of this compound to prevent menstrual bleeding as long as it is taken a cycle of any desired length could presumably be produced. We had chosen our standard day 5 through day 24 regime in the expectation of that normal cycle length would occur. Okay. Uh, if you look at this, this thing uh, that uh, concepts such as normality and similarity are medical constructs rather than rooted in nature, Pincus could have made a menstrual cycle length of any desired length. He chose to make a normal menstrual cycle that subsequently became materialized in the pill. This diminished the variety of menstrual patterns among women. All pill users have a regular cycle of 4 weeks. The pill thus literally created similarities in women's reproductive functions. Okay? I mean the, the such I mean these strategies such such strategies are also important. I mean uh, important to understand. I mean the, the the concept of similarity functions as the corner store for the development of technologies. I mean the technologies that can be used by women all over the world. That this, this, is, this, this is an assumption. I mean the, the theoretical assumption underlying the idea of universal technologies can be made to work everywhere because scientific knowledge is universal in or appears to be universal in nature. In the 1970s, scientists concluded that the development of a magic bullet, a perfect contraceptive had failed. I mean this, these are important uh, 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 discussions on one size fits all. Okay. Now, what we are, we are trying to do, okay, whether we should modify technology to fit people or we should or modify medicine to fit people or we should modify any pill to fit people or we should modify people to fit those pills. This is interesting. If you look at this, the, 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 the emphasis on similarities in the development of medical technologies such as the pill is not unproblematic, it is very much problematic. Okay. The concept of similarity functions that is what we discussed as uh, the concept of similarity functions as the, uh, as the corner store for the development of universal technologies. technologies that can be used by women uh, all over the world. Okay. That is what we, we discussed that the theoretical assumption underlying the idea of universal technologies can be made to work everywhere because scientific knowledge appears universal by nature. The, the case study of the pill uh, exemplifies the failure of this claim. Despite all the emphasis on similarities, the pill has not developed into a universal technology. The dream of making the ideal contraceptive for any woman regardless of her scientific specific background was not fulfilled. The main acceptance of the pill had been among middle and upper class women in western industrialized world with one exception at that time it was China. Most women in countries of the south that uh, 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 which had adopted sterilization and intrauterine devices as means of contraception. Scientists may explain this failure by saying that women are to blame my argu I mean uh, I mean what what uh, Woodsborn um, argues is that 
if anything is to blame it is the technology. See he, see he suggests that we may be able to understand the failures of science and technology by adopting a social constructivist approach that emphasizes the contextual nature of science and technology. In this perspective, every technology contains a configured, con configured user. Consequently, technologies cannot simply be transported elsewhere. Okay? This is important. I mean, she so was trying to look at the social constructivist approach uh, developed by uh, Biker and Pinch in the social construction of technological systems, which we discussed earlier, the Scott approach and so on. And then let us see this. Such, such dramatic shift, such drastic shift in the reproductive paradigm coincided with broader cultural changes in the late 1970s, I mean the collapse of dreams of modernity. We can discuss these things um, I mean at length and in detail. Um, I mean if you look at uh, the discourses of modernity, what are this, the central political philosophical foundations of modernity? The central philosophical and political foundations of modernity are fourfold. Okay? In this context, I am talking about European modernity, not universal modernity. See, every country, every region, every local, every village has unique constituents of modernity, unique qualities of modernity, unique factors of modernity, unique features of modernity. Okay? When I say the collapse of the dreams of modernity, I mean the collapse of the dreams of European modernity. There are four central political uh, philosophical foundations of modernity or critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Holism or totality, one. Secondly, uh, reflexivity. Thirdly, rationality and fourthly, social movements. Okay. And this, this, the universal adapt, adaption of such such four central philosophical and political foundations of modernity okay, were questioned because of the uncritical adoption of the modernization theory, which the mostly North America and Europe propagated in the 1950s and 1960s, especially after the Second World War. What is that modernization theory? I mean, modernization theory postulates the modernization theory postulates that the less developed countries will make progress provided they follow the development pattern of the developed countries. Then one size fits all. I mean, the, but, but the kind of the pattern of development which North America has used, if we follow, if we, if we ape that model, if we mimic if we, if, we, if we copy that model, then it will be a big problem for us. And we have been witnessing in the, in the context of India, in the context of many other developing countries. That is why we, we see in the emergence of dependency theory and later on dependency theory also was, uh, was not um, without any um, uh, uh, limitation, but, but it was a but the but in Latin America, they try to develop dependency theory by interrogating and rejecting modernization theory. The claims of modernization theorists, uh, especially in the in the in the United States of America uh, as well as um, Europe. Okay, that's why the 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 the, the claims which uh, uh, the 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 protagonists of modernization theory made uh, about industrialization, about development, about technology and so on, that one way to look at things. Okay. Okay. Modernization theory also can be challenged on different counts. Okay. I mean, uh, in, in sociology of development, we discuss uh, critical variable approaches, dichotomous approaches and so on to, to bring about a strong critique to the modernization theory. Okay. That is why 
the 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 collapse the, that's why when i say that this drastic shift in the reproductive paradigm coincided with the broader cultural changes in the late 1970s that that you will make that the that that a particular country will make progress only if it follows the the pattern of industrialization or the pattern of uh, uh, large projects guided by the principles of industrialization and so on. i think i think uh, uh, it also uh, uh, faced virulent criticisms uh, in the 1960s 70s and so on uh, those who wrote i mean uh, even 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 in the indian context gandhi uh, uh, opposed this in uh, hind swaraj when he said if india copies england it is my firm conviction that she will be ruined india cannot keep on aping the west for uh, uh, production of any any uh, production or employment or poverty reduction and so on india can sustain itself through villages okay gandhi mentioned this ef sumakars in small is beautiful he also mentioned this that's why gandhi once wrote no india lives in her villages that's why i mean he was trying to look at a more self reliant economy where more and more participation of the people will be there not more and more participation of machines okay that's why when you when you look at these things okay gandhi is important in this context uh, uh, sumakar is very important in this context and so on okay in this sense we are talking about the collapse of the dreams of modernity the claims of modernity or critical modernist paradigms in sociology in this sense okay i'm not looking at that how latin america africa asia they try to conceptualize modernity i'm trying to look at how when i say the collapse of the dreams of modernity i refer to euro especially european and north american modernity it collapsed okay the declining belief in grand theories and ideologies to to understand and control the world to a situation uh, control the world led to a situation in which locality and individuality became of central concern in western culture when we started with this i mean post modernity uh, tried to reject grand theories um, uh, uh, it cannot have any Mm, ideological uh, inclination uh, uh, where you will not find that you are looking at uh, um, uh, at, a, at a at a nation in its totality rather uh, a nation as being as getting fragmented into various locales okay this this fragmented imagination okay if you want to make india develop then you must be able to look at the the economically socially politically weaker states regions villages to develop educationally backward uh, regions to develop okay you you must that's why a nation it cannot be examined in its entirety because because the nation is a composite product of many things okay and and postmodernity why did they do the postmodernists why do why did they do this it is it is not uh, it is not very no uh, it is not very uh, over simplistic it is very important precisely because postmodernists tried to 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 look at each local individual in a more situated manner 
in a more context specific manner. The kind of development, the kind of development, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, uh, strategies of development which may be required for a, for a city like Mumbai or Delhi, they must be different in the context of northeast India. They must be different from the, con uh, they must be different in the context of Jammu and Kashmir. They must be different in the context of Bihar, Odisha, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, because they are different cities altogether, they are different states altogether, they are different regions altogether. Even, even within the, within Northeast India, let me tell you that we must have different strategies of development for different states in Assam, uh, from different states in Northeast India. See, they are, they are, they are, they are very unique states. Northeast India cannot be reduced to only a single state. That is why, why postmodernists did this? Because they tried to interrogate the way a society, a nation, a local has been homogenized. That is a huge contribution which postmodernists made that no, let us not homogenize culture, let us not homogenize uh, patterns of thinking, let us not homogenize our practices. If, if uh, you want to eat in spoon or in pot, I want to eat in hand, does not imply that your practice is superior to my practice or my practice is inferior to your practice, they are culturally mediated. If one fails to understand this and tries to homogenize, it is not a part of postmodernist tradition. Okay? That is why the declining belief in grand theories and ideologies to understand and control the world led to a situation in which locality and individuality became of central concern in western culture. This homogenizing tendencies must be interrogated. Okay? The notion of differences, the notion of differences became an important thing. The crisis in modernity eroded the belief in one technological fix to improve the human condition. Okay? This is very important. That now, now, if you look at this, it is time to reflect on the meaning of the shift in reproductive paradigm. Okay? Uh, it is also important to look at the ambiguities involved in the, the uh, 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 ambiguities involved in the way the history of biomedical sciences has treated both these spheres gynecology and andrology separately or similarly I mean one must strike a critical balance and the way technology has been shaped. Uh, in a more patriarchal society, uh, in a more racial structure, uh, we have we have discussed. I mean, if you look at the social shaping of technology from the very beginning, we have discussed political control of the technological systems in the con in the context of the construction of uh, the New York Bridge by Robert Moses, as it reflects uh, reflected uh, uh, the kind of um, racial prejudice and class bias. If you look at uh, uh, the way we have discussed do artifacts of politics, uh, technology as knowledge, uh, then social shaping of technology by Donald McKenzie and U. D. Walkman, what we you generally find that uh, that technologically deterministic society is not going to help us uh, if we want to modify technology to fit people. Okay? We are not, we should not try to modify people to fit technology. Then if we try to modify people to fit technology, then we are trying to homogenize cultures, cultural practices and so on. Rather we should be able to modify technology to fit people and therein comes 
uh, and uh, therein lies the significance of different technological systems. You may witness it in the context of biotechnology, nanotechnology, information technology, I mean information and communication technologies and so on. For, the, for this course, we have zeroed in on to discussing only information society by David Lyon. We will start with Toffler, uh, uh, Alvin Toffler uh, in the next lecture to, to uh, have what kind of to, to discuss what kind of issues and illusions which the information society brings. We will start with first uh, Alvin Toffler I mean in the context of the uh, third wave. Then we will go to James Martin, uh, we can discuss Daniel Bell, we can discuss, so we will discuss uh, David Lyne okay. and then we will discuss reception of modern science in India in the context of uh, um, uh, how um, uh, science or scientific knowledge was democratized or popularized in India uh, by building different scientific institutions in India uh, starting with uh, uh, the ascetic society of Bengal in 1784 and then we will discuss science policies in India uh, starting from 1958, 1983, 2003 and 2013. Okay? Thank you.